Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, myself and Jack are going to be going over the Twilight Masquerade set review. We've seen some City League data, we've seen one Champions League out in Japan, so we do have a few tournaments to base our decisions off of, and myself and Jack have sat down and begun testing a little bit here and there with some of the archetypes. So it should be a fairly well-rounded view of this really impactful set because this is going to be really important for the NAIC, the largest tournament of the year, and of course then moving into the World Championship. So let's get straight into it. And as always, we'll be taking a look at the Omnipoke rating system to sort of work out how we're going to be rating these cards. Thank you once again to everyone who uh, took part in the community ratings. You'll see them in the top right-hand corner of each slide so you can see how the community rate these cards as well in comparison to our own ratings. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, let's start off with the A specs. And the first one we're going to be taking a look at is Hyper Aroma. It's an item card that lets you search your deck for three stage one Pokemon, reveal them, and put them into your hand. Quite a simple effect, but pretty powerful. We've seen some very strong stage ones over the past uh, couple of years, particularly Curlier and things like Goldengo. But there's a couple of really powerful ones in this set as well. Dracloak and Thwacky uh, both have very strong abilities. So uh, you can see where this A spec might see some play. I think a lot of the time this is going to be outclassed by some of the more powerful uh, effects in the late game, things like Unfair Stamp, Prime Catcher, things like that. Um, but it's still quite a good consistency piece, and there has been uh, sort of a couple of decks trying it out, particularly ones which have draw engines that are built around Stage 1 Pokemon. Obviously, with a lot of these A specs, Arvin is kind of your go-to for searching for them, but when you think about Arvin, you actually end up also thinking about potentially looking at TM Evolution, which is obviously another tool card that's come out recently that actually also looks a lot better with the release of this set. This kind of effect does something very similar now. Evolution only gets two, but it automatically puts them into play in the same way that Hyper Aroma would, but you can do that from turn one, whereas if you Hyper Aroma turn one, your opponent can uh, sort of Iona your hand away and all of this kind of stuff. So I think in general, the Arvin Evo combo is just a little bit better, despite it taking more uh, slots in your deck, because Arvin is such a universal card right now. Uh, that's not to say this doesn't have some merits itself. Um, obviously, the additional uh, stage one that it gets is very impactful, but I think in general, the Arvin package is just going to be a bit more versatile overall like i say some decks have tried it out i think going forward though people will start to realize that arvin evo combo is just the better way of uh, immediately getting some stage two draw engines into play on to scoop up cyclone another item a spec it's a reprint from the black and white era putting one of your pokemon and all cards attached to it into your hand i think the difference between the black and white era and the era that we're going into is that we have some very nice very bulky high hit point stage two pokemon that we can re-establish all in one turn. Dragapult EX has low energy attack costs and is likely going to be paired with the likes of Zatu, so you can reload the Phantom Dive all in one turn. Obviously 320 hit points is a decent chunk here and it has no weakness either, so it's very often going to find opportunities to take a hit, then you can undo essentially a turn from your opponent, which is really important for the Phantom Dive attack in particular because you're sort of gaining value the more you use this attack because you have so much versatility with that damage counter placement. That's why Scoop Up Cyclone is getting such a high amount of praise and we're giving it that five star because we do think Dragapult EX is going to be a really high tier threat in the metagame. And Scoop Up Cyclone isn't guaranteed in the deck list but is very likely going to be the most popular choice. It could end up in a handful of other stage two decks as well that have tanking potential. Greninja is another pretty cheeky one where the Ninja Blade is just a one energy attack cost so quite easily you can pick up and put down your Greninja EXs and gain free turns in that regard, especially because Green Ninja could use its attack, then search out to scoop up Cyclone for the following turn as well. We have Arvin, we have Irida, these sorts of things to access the scoop up Cyclone at the right time, which makes this a really powerful choice. Onto Secret Box, another item card that says you can only use this card if you discard three other cards from your hand. Uh, if you do, you search your deck for an item, a tool, a supporter, and a stadium, reveal them and put them into your hands. So it gets kind of this combination of different cards, some cards that are more difficult to tutor than others, which is quite uh, quite cool. It's a nice effect. Uh, obviously, having to discard three other cards from your hand is a very high cost, though. So because of that, I can only really see it in decks that have very specific discard synergies. I'm thinking Lugia to discard Archeops. I'm thinking Warring Moon to discard those ancient cards. Um, I think, realistically, there's a better A spec in this set for Lugia, and there's already a couple of better A specs out there anyway. But I actually could see this competing against that ancient drum in the ancient box deck. 
I think it's still a bit of a toss-up as to which one is going to be stronger, but this is some very powerful discard synergy. Um, and, you know, these decks are already playing extra copies of discard cards like Ultra Ball anyway to just have more activations and get more uh, things or ancient cards into the discard pile to do more damage with Vengeance Fletching. So I could definitely see this being an alternative to Ancient Drum, having to being able to tutor out specific pieces rather than drawing some additional extra cards. Uh, some of the time you're just drawing to find energies and stuff anyway, but sometimes you are drawing to try and find that extra side or anything like that so this could tutor out those specific pieces you need uh, in that ancient box deck i think realistically that's probably the only deck it's going to see uh, any success in and i still think it's a bit up for debate a little bit but uh, it does actually give you a bit of a damage boost which is nice as well as picking out some key pieces that are harder to find um, things like the tools and stuff as well can be quite annoying so yeah a nice little synergy card not going to be blowing anything away but uh, could be good in the ancient box deck onto unfair stamp a very versatile item a spec of course you can only play this card if one of your Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn, but each player shuffles their hand into their deck, you get five cards, your opponent gets two. This is a great way to put the brakes on aggressive archetypes. They come out the gate swinging with an early Cramorant or an early Maridon. We know these sort of low to the ground basic attacking decks that can pressurize so early, especially against evolving archetypes that are going to take a turn off most of the time. You can immediately use this unfair stamp, give yourself a fairly decent hand refresh, but in the process, force your opponent to have some sort of engine. Suddenly they could be down to just drawing from Radiant Greninja or Mu EX as their sort of best case scenario. And in some cases, they may not even have an engine established at all. So they could be really limited to the really low hand size and really stop some aggressive archetypes. I think this is going to be a very valid choice if there is aggressive archetypes in the meta. It looks like Maridon's going to be back in a big way in this set, so it does feel like a really good card for that matchup. And I think there's going to be a number of slower evolving decks that could really take advantage of this. Uh, there's even a Luxray EX you can see on the slide. Maybe there could be some hand locking combos going on here where you put your opponent to a large hand size, then snipe certain cards out of your opponent's hand so they can't even deal with that. And obviously, you can use Unfair Stamp alongside things like Counter Catcher. So you could go for a KO on the bench or even Boss plus Unfair Stamp, similar to how we've seen Counter Catcher Iono be a combo to get rid of an engine and reduce the hand size. Now we have the reverse of that, which is Unfair Stamp plus Boss's orders to achieve the same combination. So, very very versatile ace spec, it's certainly an option for Dragapult, certainly an option for Charizard, Gardevoir, these archetypes can immediately start thinking about this, and there will be situations, especially in more aggressive formats where there are these low to the ground basic attacking decks, where you can completely stop them in their tracks. Really, really powerful card. Onto Survival Brace, a Pokemon tool card, also an ace spec. Uh, if the Pokemon this card is attached to has full HP and will be knocked out by damage from an attack, uh, instead of being knocked out, it just goes down to 10 HP and you discard the Survival Brace. So basically, it's a guaranteed one-turn survival from a one-hit KO. The only real synergies this card is going to end up having, I think, is going to be on revenge-style attackers and attackers that have outrage-style attacks, like this new Hearthflame Mask Ogapon. Uh, the Rattle Heart does 20 damage times the number of damage counters on this Pokemon. So obviously, you take a hit, you then have 200 damage on you, you're then dealing 400 damage back. Uh, that's the only real place for this kind of card, I think. I don't think there's too many... Uh, synergies for even controlling archetypes because we have such good controlling ace specs already there's also a lot of things like lost vacuum and the new jamming tower that are going to be in decks that i think make this an even harder sell because they just turn off the survival brace before uh, it would get any effect at all so i think this is one of the weakest ace specs we've seen uh, not only in the set but overall and because of that it's not really going to have too many applications there's not many attackers that would benefit from it and there's way too many ways around getting around the one of ace spec in your deck that it just ends up being wasted so quite a weak one overall unfortunately we move on to Legacy Energy, probably the salvation of Lugia V-Star. As long as this card is attached to a Pokemon, it provides every type of energy, but only provides one energy at a time. And once per game, if the Pokemon this card is attached to is knocked out by damage from an attack from your opponent's Pokemon, they take one fewer prize card. So it's mashing a Rainbow Energy style effect alongside a Life Do. So it's almost a spiritual reprint of another card from the Black and White era. This time it's in a special energy form. There are means of turning off special energy and I do think that will be a large element of the format. We're already seeing Temple of Sinnoh make its way into a number of archetypes as well as Enhanced Hammer but what's great is you can get immediate value from this card as well. It's kind of unlike the survival cast why Jack was saying it's so poor is that your opponent can answer this card but at least legacy energy can get into the mix and get its value because it's already providing that rainbow energy effect for us which means iron hands is an amazing option once again in Lugia previously it was kind of difficult to weave in because we had to use earthen vessel and base 
basic energy to turn attach to this card. Now you can just simply pull them out of the deck with Archeops, so you can time your Iron Hands much more effectively. It also is going to be great for Luminion V, which is pretty much a staple in Lugia, so you can access some of your crucial supporter Pokemon to get your Summoning Star combination off by turn two. Now we can use this Legacy Energy on a Luminion to throw it back into the deck and remove those easy prize cards from the opponent, ideally throwing up something like a Minchino or something to give to your opponent to force a one prize it into the mix. It also just gives even more attacking options to Lugia. There's both a Wellspring Ogre Pony X, which can be used for, as an early game sniping threat, as well as the Cornerstone Mask, which could help out in a number of other matchups by having an annoying walling presence in the deck. So Lugia becomes much more versatile and has this sort of situation where your opponent has to insta find their response card to Legacy Energy. And if that doesn't happen, you can be really running away with a prize race. Let's not forget you could throw this onto even something like a Chinchino or a Lugia itself and also give up one less prize card. So this card isn't just going to be useful for its rainbow effect. If it's not answered by your opponent on exactly that one turn clock, they are going to be in a huge amount of trouble. So this is a very powerful A-spec, obviously going to be replacing that Master Ball, which was kind of the best we had in Lugia. And it's a big deal for this archetype and one of the reasons why it's really back on the map. Onto the regular trainers now. And the first is Accompanying Flute. This is an item card that lets you look at the top five of your opponent's deck. And you put any number of basic Pokemon you find there onto their bench. And they shuffle the remaining cards back into their deck. Uh, so this kind of competes uh, with Mantine in some of these controlling and stalling archetypes. Uh, there's benefits to both. There's uh, sort, of, sort of pros and cons to both. I think this will actually end up uh, potentially overtaking that spot, though, just because it's an insta-play item that you can then use counter catcher to gust up and try and block something in the active, whereas at the moment you have to spend the turn using Born Ashore on Mantine and then hope that the... Uh, your, the opponent can't take advantage of the fact that they're then not being blocked in the active. Uh, so I think it is overall slightly better. Obviously, this is also an item card, so arguably a bit more searchable. You can use this multiple times if you end up missing, whereas obviously you have to use Born Ashore at a very specific time when you know you're going to get something. You're going to have multiple sort of hits of this, as well as sort of being a pseudo mill card as well. It potentially puts some Pokemon onto the out of the deck and onto the bench, meaning that they have less turns to be able to try and win the game as well. So it covers a lot of different bases. Um, um, Snorlax has just done really well recently in Europe, and uh, it sort of has had ebbed and flowed throughout the Temporal Forces meta, uh, but I still think it's going to be pretty good. I still think Lugia, as we've just said, is going to be a big problem. It seems to be getting a big buff from this set, but there's still some very positive matchups out there for Snorlax, so uh, I think this is going to be a really good tool for it. I don't think it's going to um, be crazy good, but I definitely think it's going to make it into these controlling archetypes, maybe even into like the Pidgeot control as well. I could definitely see it in there too. So yeah, very, very cool tool for control that potentially means that they don't have to waste more times and more turns with Mantine like they have in the past. Onto the bug catching set, some grass specific support in the form of an item card that lets us look at the top seven cards of the deck. You can choose up to two in any combination of grass Pokemon and basic grass energy that you find there, reveal them and put them into your hand and shuffle the deck. This is amazing for grass specific archetypes. There are a couple coming out from this set actually. The Teal Mask Ogapon has a very enticing ability and you're likely going to want access to not just grass Pokemon, but also energy in decks like those. So you can cash in on that teal dance ability as often as possible. So bug catching set is likely going to have really good ratios in Ogre Pond style decks where they're likely going to have like 10 grass energy. And also the new festival lead deck utilizing two stage one grass types, Thwacky and Diplin, are once again going to have fantastic ratios at their disposal where you're most likely going to be maximizing your counts of Thwacky, Grookey, Diplin and Applin. So you're naturally just seeing a lot of options from the bug catching set. It allows you to cut some corners by having sometimes reduced energy counts and knowing that the bug catching set can tutor these out for you throughout the game as well. So it allows you to deck build in such a way that you have good consistency in the opening without really compromising too many deck spaces. The reason why this isn't getting a higher rating is that we think the grass archetypes are most likely going to be mid tier rather than very, very high tier decks. So despite the item being phenomenal and huge for grass stuff going forward, we can't really in good conscience give it much more than the three star right now. On to Enhanced Hammer, another reprint from various areas throughout the Pokemon TCG. Uh, just discards a special energy attached to one of your po opponent's Pokemon. Uh, this obviously is naturally a really good way of trying to slow your opponent down, whether it's from a controlling perspective or just uh, in any deck that has ways of searching out Enhanced Hammers to try and slow them down by an attachment. There's not loads and loads of special energy out there right now, and obviously the one special energy focus deck, Lugia, is able to accelerate four per turn. So it's going to be used for getting rid of specific special energy rather than slowing things down from a tempo perspective as it has been in the past. 
The specific ones are things like Gift Energy to stop your opponent drawing cards after you take a knockout, Mist Energy to allow your effective attacks to go through your opponent's Pokemon. So I'm thinking things like Roaring Moon's Frenzied Gouging and Sableye's Lost Mine. And then Legacy Energy, as we've just discussed, it stops one, not only your opponent getting some of these cool attacks from the rainbow effect, but two, uh, it means that you're actually taking the full amount of prizes, which is really, really important. As we've kind of talked about, there's already been some decks that are implementing things like Sinnoh as well. Um, so it kind of competes for that spot, but I think this is generally a bit better because you're able to search this with Arvin, with Irida, with all of these different ways of searching for item cards. And it's, um, again, a little bit more um, spe specific on where you're targeting your energy, but I think you only need to target specific energy. So you don't necessarily need the full effect of Sinnoh. I think any of these decks that already play Arvin engines can definitely fit in an E-Hammer, things like the Dragapult and the Charizard decks. But as I've mentioned, it could just be a really important tool for control to help slow down the opponent. Still don't think it's going to make Control's life into Lugia completely free, but it could definitely be a really important one to try and slow them down and get yourself over the line so that they run out of energy, uh, which has kind of been the issue with Control against Lugia in the past. So yeah, a very, very important tool. I don't think it's going to be in every deck, but it will have some really important uses for decks that don't like things like Mist Energy, Legacy Energy, and Gift Energy. Onto Ogre's Mask. This is an item card that's going to help out the Ogre Pony Xs. We get four different masks in this set, and the item itself says choose a Pokemon EX in your discard pile that has Ogapon in its name and switch it with one of your Pokemon EX that has Ogapon in its name. So it's a little switcheroo from a grass one into a fire one or vice versa or whatever you want to do. That's the sort of combination that we're going for here. Any attached cards, damage counters, special conditions and turns in play and all the other remaining effects are on the new Pokemon. This is a nice synergy that we have with this sort of Ogapon deck I suppose is what they're trying to provide us with here because the teal mask ogapon doesn't have that impressive of, of an attack unless you're hitting for weakness but has the best ability by far and then the other three ogapon are all kind of more situational cards that can come up at different times in the game so using mostly your teal mask ogapon to accelerate energy throughout the game whilst getting a few extra card draws thanks to the teal dance ability then means that Maybe in the early game you can use Wellspring to use Torrential Pump and take out not only an active Pokemon but also some low hit point basic Pokemon. If you're able to tank hits with an Ogapon, you can turn into the Hearth Flame Mask Ogapon via this mask and suddenly you have a high damage output threat. Or there could be some matchups where using the Cornerstone Mask Ogapon can outright win the game. If your opponent doesn't have enough answers to this one card, you can just play one copy of the Cornerstone Ogapon knowing that you have Ogre's Mask in your deck to consistently turn back into that Ogapon to eventually just leave your opponent with no option to take KOs on the board. So that's what they're kind of going with here with an Ogapon EX deck. Our concern is that this hasn't really kicked off in Japan just yet. The overall situational nature of the archetype means that you come out the gate swinging and have high tempo, but you really are lacking some oomph in the archetype. I think some of your highest damage output options are like Blood Moon Ursa Luna in the late game or possibly Weird Ear V. Those sorts of things could go into the deck list, but it's more so looking like like the Teal Mask Ogapon is going to stand above the others as an engine Pokemon for other archetypes rather than being this entire build around of like a pure Ogre deck, which is a shame for me because Swoop Teleporter and Surprise Time Machine are some of my favorite cards back from the EX era. But that's really how we're seeing this archetype right now as being a little bit low tier, despite being consistent and fast to get on the board. The Ogapon themselves are still a little bit too situational right now. Onto the supporters and the first is Carmine. Uh, this is just a very simple one. If you go first, you may play this card during your first turn. You discard your hand and draw five cards. So it's kind of like a mini research, but can be used on the first turn of play. Uh, normally, I think this card would get a very, very low rating, but for the specific effect and for the um, this very specific few decks that you might end up seeing this in, uh, this actually does get a three-star rating from us. Because we have Luminion and Ultra Ball to be able to search this out, there are some archetypes that could see benefit from having an extra turn of discarding your hand. In particular, Maridon, obviously the aggressive nature of it, similarly with that Teal Mask Ogapon. But the main one is actually Lugia V-Star, trying to have an extra turn of being able to discard Archeops. If you can use two researchers, essentially, to try and get Archeops in the bin rather than just that one that you would normally get. Uh, you can end up making your summoning star rods a little bit better. And in one of the latest Champions Leagues, uh, this was a very popular card in Lugia. So it is worth that three star. Normally, I think it would get quite a low rating, but there are a couple of very specific archetypes that really do like this effect. I don't think it's going to be in everything. I don't think there's going to be many decks that play it outside of ones that have specific discard synergies, but this could definitely see play in Lugia V-Star for sure. On to Hassle, an interesting 
supporter card. We are rating it a little bit low, but that's because there aren't really many great homes for the card rather than the effect itself being that weak. Um, it's likely going to only ever show up in like low counts because it is one of these situational supporters. You can only play this card if one of your Pokemon were knocked out during your opponent's last turn. But you get to look at the top eight cards of your deck and put three of them into your hand, shuffling the rest back into your deck. Comparing this to something like a Chorus's Experiment, which obviously has other reasons why it's played so heavily in Lost Zone decks, uh, because you're fueling your Lost Zone the entire time, but seeing five and keeping three is already like quite a strong effect, so much so that there have been non-Lost Zone archetypes that have sometimes played Chorus just to sort of add to the overall support account. And I think Hassle could be in that sort of area, especially in like single prize archetypes, where because you're seeing eight cards, that's such a big dig into the deck, and with no downside here, you get to shuffle the other cards back in anyway. Keeping three cards of those eight is a really, really powerful option. So much so that it could go alongside Chorus in like a Charizard Lost Box, possibly. That's most likely the best way to go. There aren't that many other fantastic single prize archetypes. Maybe the new Thwacky Diplin deck could look at having one copy of this in the list because you can Thwacky it out for the right situation, then use Hassle maybe towards the latter stages of the game when you've thinned out your deck, so you have good odds to hit certain targets. I think that's where this is going to land. Just be a one of sometimes here and there in predominantly single prize decks, so you have more opportunities to use this Hassle supporter. He could chip in here and there, but it's not going to be all that popular just because we have such a high bar for supporters right now. On to Kieran, another supporter card that has a choose one effect. You can either switch your active Pokemon with one of your bench Pokemon, or during this turn, your Pokemon's attacks do 30 more damage to your opponent's active EX and V Pokemon. So two very, very strong effects, to be honest. And I think realistically, two effects that potentially make the card interesting regardless. Um, the switch effect is obviously a little bit less interesting, but right now we do have Aerie in format, and we've just, again, mentioned how good control is right now. One of the key reasons is because Aerie is able to pitch out some specific switching options your uh, deck may have, but they're all item-based. This is actually a supporter-based switching, so that's really important. But also the extra damage is very, very relevant. One, because we have so many Pokemon right now that have very large HP. Uh, you're able to actually reach into the 300, 330 ranges now with multiple different um, sort of damage manipulators. You've got things like the tools, and now you have Kieran as well, so that's really important. Even in things like Charizard as well, being able to play Kieran in the mirror match to try and hit that Charizard EX uh, for 330 a turn earlier because you have to take one your opponent has to take one less prize for burning darkness to be hitting enough damage now but also in that festival lead deck I do think the card really shines uh, because you attack twice you're able to basically double dip on Kieran's effect and you do effectively 60 more damage which is really powerful considering the uh, do the wave attack is a little bit weak against things that you're not dealing uh, super effective damage against. So yeah, it means that you're actually able to potentially take some KOs that you wouldn't normally be able to take, which is nice. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be a supporter that we've seen these kind of supporters before. They always end up as like the ninth or 10th supporters, but they're very consistently the ninth or 10th supporters because both effects are so versatile and are so flexible that you'll, you'll always find a way of using these cards um, in the different situations that you may need them. So yeah, very powerful, quite a simple card, but really, really effective. And I think a lot of decks will end up seeing this as a one-off just for the damage and switching effects. On to Lana's Aid, almost a spiritual reprint of Clara that's obviously rotated. It puts three in any combination of Pokemon and basic energy cards uh, from your discard pile into your hand, as long as those Pokemon don't have a rule box. So mostly trying to help out some one prize attacking archetypes. Again, the Diplin Thwacky deck comes to mind. Also could be pretty interesting for some controlling archetypes if you're trying to get back things like your Mawile combo or something along those lines. It could be pretty handy. It might make it into the Ancient deck. Obviously, they are so heavily tied to their Ancient supporter cards, but getting guaranteed access to some energy at the same time can certainly be handy on your sort of off turns. We know that the Explorer's Guidance can be weaved in at times, so also you could use the Lana on those sort of key turns where you don't have to Sada. So yeah, there are some opportunities for this supporter to show up, even if it is just in one or two counts. Because it's a supporter card, there's situations where you can have Palpad in the deck list and then you have tons of recovery in just a two card combo. Maybe it even goes alongside some super odd in the list as well. The fact that we get this immediate access has always been a pretty powerful combination. It's much more limited to when we did have Clara because Radiant Charizard was one of the biggest combos that we actually had at the time with Clara. So definitely gonna be lower than that power level, but still can show up in some of these lower tier archetypes. Onto the tools and handheld fan is the first one. Whenever your active Pokemon is damaged by an opponent's attack, you move an energy from the attacking Pokemon to one of your opponent's bench. So 
this is very much kind of that controlling aspect, maybe uh, a tool for the Snorlax and Pidgeot decks out there. They already have a lot of good tools, so I think it's already competing uh, for quite a premium spot. But this essentially is kind of like a Crushing Hammer Heads or an Enhanced Hammer, because you can choose where the energy goes and you can choose to move the energy to something that's never going to be able to make use of it, like a Luminion, a Manaphy, a Rotom, or even a Barrel potentially. You can move all of the energy off and put it in a more awkward place. So it kind of works as that Crushing Hammer Heads. Now it's not uh, obviously gone forever, and if your opponent has a way of picking it up or moving the energy uh, themselves, it's not as powerful, but it is at least a uh, guaranteed energy that their op your opponent has to find on the next turn to try and attack again. Uh, these controlling decks have played Clawth in the past, which is obviously has a very similar effect, and this is much better because it means that you don't have to have a Clawth in the active, you can have whatever you want in the active and just have a tool attached. Admittedly, you can then get around it with things like Vacuum and Jamming Tower, but Handheld Fan at least does mean that you don't need to run a arguably bad card in your deck now so slight upgrade to those uh, control decks i think like i say it competes for um the tool spot and there's already some very 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 good controlling tools right now so i don't know whether it actually makes it in all the time but it could be an interesting way of just trying to uh, eke out some more resources from your opponent when you're in this sort of uh, attrition battle between yourself and them onto the festival grounds now the stadium itself has its own text and it's really not that impressive all pokemon in play that have energy attached to them can't be affected by special conditions conditions and you also heal special conditions from any Pokemon that have energy attached to them. This is basically a relevant text because the main reason we want to play this stadium card is because there are a couple of Pokemon that have this festival lead ability. You can see the Diplin here that says if festival grounds is in play this Pokemon may use an attack it has twice. So the first attack KOs your opponent can then send up another Pokemon as well. So the whole idea here is that festival grounds has this kind of maybe handy text in very niche situations but the main thing is it's an enabler for this lower tier archetype where Dipin now can deal that do the wave 20 for each of your bench two times over. So you can hit effectively 200 with this one stage one Pokemon. So the festival grounds its own text is terrible, but thanks to the abilities of other Pokemon, it becomes a relevant stadium and is basically the build around of this new fun archetype that we have, the Thwacky Diplin Festival archetype. Onto Jamming Tower, I've mentioned it a couple of times already. A very simple one, your Pokemon tool cards in play, both players have no effect. So it's essentially two Lost Vacuums when you think about it combined. You're essentially turning off the tool that Lost Vacuum would put into the Lost Zone, and you're also bouncing the Stadium that the Lost Vacuum would put into the Lost Zone. So it does both of those effects in one, and for that very reason, it seems like an immediate upgrade on Lost Vacuum. Turns out that being able to search for Lost Vacuum with things like Arvin and Irida just makes the card much more accessible and therefore much more usable. Jamming Tower does potentially stay in play for multiple turns and hit multiple tools at once. You can maybe turn off bravery charms and heroes capes all at once and take multiple prizes as well as being a bounce for things like pokestop and temple of sinnoh which look like they're still going to be very very popular stadiums but because of that searchability it's not quite seeing as much of an impact as first thought still think it's a very relevant one and there will be times where this is just the best stadium to play because you don't necessarily rely on tools yourself or specific stadiums and you're able to play multiple copies of these to maybe get around trying to have to find the one lost vacuum that you play um, but i don't think it's going to be in everything until we lose Lost Vacuum to the rotation next year. So uh, one to keep in mind, I don't think it's going to have a massive impact for now, but there are some very, very relevant tools in format at the moment, and this could be a way of being able to turn all of them off at once and, uh, you know, really cause a bit of a headache. Then we have a number of uh, bulk trainer cards that we are just going to zoom through. We'll tell you what they do, but you should know that based on pretty much all these ratings that we don't see any applications for these cards. So the Lucky Helmet uh, can draw two cards if your stuff's taking damage. Not a big deal, especially when it's not drawing cards immediately. Boomerang Energy can recover an energy if you've discarded it from the effect of an attack. We have nothing relevant that does that right now. Love Ball can search for a Pokemon that has the same name as one of your opponent's Pokemon in play. Again, like maybe for playing the most popular archetype in the room, or if you just play a huge number of types, maybe this sees players like a one-off, but very, very rarely, and you'd have to be skewing your deck, and there'll be a number of rounds in every tournament where this is a dead card. And the Community Center can do some healing if you've played a supporter. We have other better healing stadiums, so if we were looking for that sort of effect, even for things like Gardevoir, um, we have better ones already in the format. So no real home for any of these archetypes, and 
and their effects themselves aren't that strong. Maybe a couple of them, like Boomerang, could be in the waiting room for a new card to come out, but for the most part, I don't even think any of these are really worth picking up. Similarly, there's some bulk supporters as well. We've got Caretaker that draws two cards, and if Community Center's in play, you can shuffle Caretaker back into your deck. You're having to play two bad cards then, so it's just not really good enough. Lucian shuffles the hands and puts them to the bottom of the deck of both players, and then each player flips a coin. If you get heads, you draw six. If you get tails, you draw three. It's just a worse Iono for the majority of the game, so it's never worth relying on. And finally, Perrin reveals two Pokemon from your hand. Shuffle into your deck and then search your deck for that many Pokemon and reveal them. So it's like a double Pokemon communication. Again, we have much better ball search right now. It's just not worth spending your supporter um, to search for two Pokemon. We have better ball search. We have better supporters. It's not worth wasting your turn to do this. Then we have the trainer summary. So pause now if you want to get that little snapshot. But we're moving on to the EXs and we'll start with Teal Mask Ogapon. I've alluded to it already a couple of times throughout the video because there are some synergies that we've already mentioned, but the Ogapon itself is a 210 hit point grass type Terrastal EX. It has the Teal Dance ability. Once during your turn, you can attach a basic grass energy from your hand to this Pokemon. If you did, you can draw a card. And obviously this is a stackable ability, so you can have up to four Teal Mask Ogapon in play using each of their own Teal Dances to get a lot of energy acceleration on the board. The Okapon itself has the Myriad Leaf Shower attack for 3 Grass Energy, dealing 30 plus 30 more for each energy attached to both active Pokemon. Most likely this is looking towards like 2 shot range unless you're hitting into Charizard EX which is obviously very relevant and might make Ogapon good on its own because even if this is going to predominantly be an engine Pokemon, the fact that you have this Grass typing in addition to all of that engine help is going to mean you naturally have a better time into the Charizard matchup which is still going to be relevant in this format. I know Charizard's being brought down a peg or two, not only by the grass stuff coming out in this set, but also Dragapult seem to be tricky matchups. So having this boast into Charizard isn't quite as strong as it is currently, but it still will be somewhat relevant. Because that Myriad Leaf Shower is only really middling damage, and we've seen the other Ogre's Mask Pokemon, I've alluded to it, that the other Ogres that we'll get onto in a moment are more situational options. It's more than likely that Teal Mask is going to find a way to be a springboard for other archetypes. The Raging Bolt's Bellowing Thunder can deal more damage discarding basic energy from all of your Pokemon in play, which means this Ogapon could be a great bench-sitting threat that constantly teal dances throughout the game, and then you bellow those energies back into the discard pile for huge damage output options, and is a big upgrade for Raging Bolt over the Sandy Shocks EX that we currently have to sort of wait around until the mid-game until we can start activating those. Now you can be a lot more proactive with Raging Bolt pushing those knockouts much earlier on in the game, which is interesting. And Reggie Drago V-Star has always been lacking that good acceleration. It's previously had to wait on Arceus, and then you're just a clunkier Arceus deck than the other ones we've already had in format. Or you've had to use things like Gardenia's Vigor, or even that Dragonite as like an Apex Dragon copy option. All of those are horrible. We finally have a much better option in the Teal Dance Ogapon, plus playing Quad Energy Switch in the deck list. So you can actually get the Reggie Drago V-Star rolling on turn two much more reliably, and even have this backup attacker when need be into the Charizard matchup. So the Regidrago also gains Dragapult EX as a new attacking threat in the format as well. So we are going to tentatively give Ogapon a three star. I think it will be really helpful in these most likely mid tier archetypes still because they do still have their own weaknesses. Like Regidrago is still not all that consistent because you are shoving in a lot of Dragon Pokemon and have to find ways to discard them. Raging Bolt EX, yes, it's very good at blowing up stuff, but there are also going to be a number of single prize attacking decks and that's where things get trickier for the archetype. So we think these could still end up being mid-tier threats, but the Ogapon is the star of the show. Onto the other Ogapons, however, and there are three other types that Ogapon dons. We have the Fire-type Hearth Flame Mask, which has the Wrathful Heart attack, which deals 20 damage times the number of damage counters on this Pokemon. I've already mentioned it a little bit. Again, the best application is kind of Ogres masking into this one after one of your Ogapons has taken a hit, but you don't have that much HP in the first place, so it's quite hard to survive a hit anyway. Um, so yeah, that's really the only application for Hearth Flame Mask. It could be an option in the Arceus Armor Rouge deck, and Dynamic Blaze does deal 280 to Evolution Pokemon, which is quite impressive for 3 energy. But So I don't actually see this necessarily as Ogapon card, as opposed to just a Fire-type attacker for that sort of mid-tier archetype. Onto Wellspring Mask. Wellspring Mask has Sob, which stops things from retreating, and Torrential Pump, which we've already talked about, that deals 100. If you shuffle 3 energy into your deck, you can then do 120 to one of your opponent's benched Pokemon. I think this is the Ogapon that has the most potential outside of Teal Mask, just because you can use Teal Mask to accelerate a load of energy, and then Ogre's Mask and Energy Switch it onto this one, and then Torrential Pub potentially on turn one. I think that's the scariest thing about this deck, um, is the fact that you can 
potentially take out double Charmander or double Dreepy or double whatever your opponent's playing of their low HP basics before they actually get a turn to evolve them. That is quite scary. Um, again, in our early testing, it wasn't all that consistent at doing that. And there's obviously still various archetypes where there, your opponent won't play things that you can be uh, using Torrential Pump on. This could also be an attacker for Lugia with that legacy energy. Again, it's obviously another type of attack that your opponent then has to play around, not huge amounts of damage or double prizes uh, through the active with Iron Hands. It's then sniping. So I think that might end up being the best solution for that. But equally, um, it's not seen in all Lugia lists out there. So it may not even be good enough for that. And then finally, there's Cornerstone Mask, which is the fighting type, and it has that Cornerstone Stance ability, which prevents all damage from attacks done for Pokemon by your opponent's Pokemon that have an ability. Uh, that's quite a lot of different Pokemon right now, Charizard, Chi and Pao, all of these different strong attacking archetypes. Um, admittedly, we are seeing Dragapult basically come in and be a very, very powerful threat, and it doesn't have an ability, so it's already still being damaged by the most powerful EX in the format. So I think that alone kind of puts Cornerstone uh, Mask Ogapon in uh, a bit of a corner. It's also got Demolish, which is a wall-breaking attack, but it doesn't deal weakness, so uh, it's actually only ever doing a flat 140 damage without mods, so uh, it's not even like it's going to be dealing with things like Iron Hands and Blissey and stuff like that. It's just trying to wall break through a Mimikyu. The best you can do is like Ogre's Mask into this to try and break through something like a Mimikyu, but I don't even think that's good enough. So uh, yeah, all of these uh, Ogre Ponds don't really do enough, and I think the deck has turned out to be a bit too clunky, and it does a lot of tricksy things, but it doesn't actually do enough raw damage to be able, able to be like a solid type advantage deck so yeah it's a bit of a weak one overall i think wellspring is the best of the three the other two just seem a little bit awkward and a little bit too weak to see any play i think super successfully onto palafin ex it's a stage one ex pokemon but wait it does have an ability the hero spirit says put this pokemon into play only with the effect of palafin's zero to hero ability so let's jump over to the right quickly to see the palafin that we also gained from the set that has that ability zero to hero once during a turn when this pokemon moves from the active to the bench you can search your deck for a Palafin EX, then switch it with this Pokemon. Any attached cards, damage counters, and blah blah blah, all remain on the new Pokemon, and you shuffle the Zero to Hero Palafin back into the deck. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to get the regular Stage 1 Palafin into the active, then move it to the bench, and suddenly you can activate that Hero Spirit, and then you are into play. So it is a Stage 1, but with a few extra steps involved. The upside is that we jump all the way up to 340 hit points, and we have a very powerful 1 energy attack in Giga Impact. 250 damage, and during next turn, this Pokemon can't attack. I think that text is fine, a little bit annoying, obviously, but because we're already having to shimmy our Palafins for the Zero to Hero ability, we're going to naturally play a number of switching cards in the deck list regardless. So that's really the first hurdle to jump through. We're playing the Stage 1 deck, even though we have to play like extra counts of our Stage 1 line because of the annoying ability that we have here. And we also have to kit our deck out with a lot of switching cards. So there are a couple things that can take advantage or make our switching situation a little bit easier. Things like a Lost Zone Engine also loves to play lots of switching cards, so you can use Flower Selecting over and over again. Jet Energy could also be a pretty easy option here with such a cheap cost on Palafin. You could be using Jets on Conphase to move in and out of the active, so that could be pretty handy. As we know, Water Energy goes quite nicely in Lost Zone box decks because we already have Radiant Greninja as like a Mirage Gate option. So that could be a little package that we have going on here. The Dunsparce was also the other one that sort of came to mind where you naturally have free retreat on Dunsparce. So you could constantly just use one switch card, go into a free retreater, then go back into your Palafin and then even draw more cards with Runaway Draw when need be. So that was the other kind of option. The biggest issue with the Dunsparce is that it's very weak into the new Dragapult archetype because your Dunsparce have that low 60 hit points. So the Dunsparce unfortunately has seen a bit of play but might be falling off as soon as this set comes out if Dragapult is going to be taking over the metagame. So that does limit Palafin to basically one archetype which is a kind of clunkier version of Lost Zone and that's why we're giving it that lower rating. It's also hilarious how badly this deck gets ruined by TM Devo as well. <laughs> you pick up your Palafin EX then it's clogged in your hand so you have to hope that you can search out the other Zero to Hero Palafin and find a way to put your EXs back into the deck possibly. That's going to be a horrible situation as long as they're not getting KO'd as well which would be a whole other issue in itself so yeah just another hurdle right now and TM Devo is actually a relevant card because there is going to be some sprinkle going on 
Um, there's even things like Frostlass from this set, which might be looking to Devo. Yeah, there's a few archetypes that will have this tool card. We've seen it already in this format just to deal with like Charizard mirror matches and uh, be a problem for Chen Pao. I think there's no reason to see Devo going away anytime soon. And that would be another huge headache for Palafin, unfortunately. On to Luxray X. We've already talked about it a little bit. It's a 310 HP lightning type. With that piercing glint attack for two colorless energy, you deal 120 damage and you look at your opponent's hand and discard one card you find there. Obviously, really, really powerful. We've seen even the effects of things like Airy uh, being able to discard specifically items is just really, really powerful because this, uh, whilst it's only one card, allows you to get rid of a key supporter or a key Pokemon or even an energy card in your opponent's hand and really slow them down, as well as dealing some damage as well and putting some pressure from a prize's perspective uh, on your opponent's board too. Um, in combination with that unfair stamp, you can potentially like push your opponent down to two cards, then piercing glint and try and get rid of their key card in their hand. So uh, they end up having a one card hand and piercing glint does 120 damage, which obviously is enough to be able to KO something like a barrel as well. Now, we're probably going to be using double turbo on this, so you may not be able to uh, target some of those key support Pokemon that you normally may uh, be able to with some other attacks. But still being able to have that such such a strong like hand locking combination does at least make the card quite interesting. We also have the Shinx uh, that has that big raw ability that pushes your opponent's active Pokemon out of the way, which uh, could be quite interesting. It's again, another annoying thing for your opponent to deal with. Um, so there's there's lots of like locking options built into this uh, evolution line. I think realistically though, Luxray V Hero's Cape is actually almost always just a better Luxray EX. It's the same HP. Admittedly, you have to spend your A spec on a Hero's Cape rather than an unfair stamp, but we have other ways of being able to manipulate the hand, things like Aerie and stuff. And Fang Snipe obviously is a very, very similar attack, but this is all in a basic rather than a stage two Pokemon. So I think that's actually why Luxray is going to end up falling down and not being a particularly strong option because the Pidgeot control decks already have a basic version of this that is arguably just as good it does less damage but sometimes that's also just as good if not better because it means that you can lock something that your opponent doesn't want on pl in play in the active and you're not really dealing damage to them so they're not going to be able to get the free switch when you take a knockout so yeah luxray falls down at the hands of another luxray to be honest because there's just a better one out there already which is a shame because i think the card could be really really cool in a different meta but right now we just have a better way of doing basically everything that luxray can do already on a basic pokemon onto iron thorns ex it's a new future basic Pokemon. It's got 230 hit points and is a lightning type. Its ability is initialize. While this Pokemon is in the active position, Pokemon with a rule box, except any future Pokemon, don't have any abilities. Certainly a scary ability where you are shutting down a decent chunk of the format, honestly, and it is going to be a headache for a number of archetypes. It's also got the Bolt Cyclone attack for lightning into colorless, dealing 140, and you can move one energy from this Pokemon to one of your benched Pokemon. That attack's certainly serviceable, so this can be a Pokemon that kind of just chills out in the active spots and does its thing. We actually did see in a Champions League tournaments, this Iron Thorns get a pretty decent placement as a pure quad deck, where it was using lots of hand disruption and energy disruption style cards, those crushing hammers, those Aries, hit point buffing tools and whatnot, and it basically just had like turbo energize and like DTEs in the deck to uh, really power up multiple Iron Thorns throughout the game. I do think it's going to be a little bit more limited than that. It has caused a bit of a shift in the metagame though. Lugia archetypes are having to play things like Fluttermane. Gardevoir has played Fluttermane in the past and also has to sort of take notes. And a few other archetypes are looking to just have things like Iron Bundle in their deck list, possibly to push Iron Thorns away, because that ability can be so frustrating. I do think this is most likely going to be a bit part player in likely the future box archetype to be this headache Pokemon for a handful of archetypes or an easy searchable option for the Maridon EX. Obviously, this can be a great target for Generator. It's also a four retreat cost Pokemon. So if you're already playing those heavy batons for your uh, Iron Hands, this could be another user of that, which isn't really a bad thing. Even if you are moving one energy off, retaining two more is just more help for you throughout the game. The reason why we're giving it a sort of mid rating is is that the Quad Thorns deck has really fallen off since Dragapult has been released in Japan because it's a really awkward matchup. I also think that you're not really locking a number of these archetypes if they are going to be using Flutter or Iron Bundle, and I think these are both decent cards anyway in the archetypes that they come into. So I don't think this Quad deck is really going to work. The damage output's a little bit too shoddy, and there's enough ways around it. So it's more than likely going to be like a sometimes one-of in the future archetype and Maridon. Admittedly, these are like high-tier archetypes, and we do think Maridon's going to be very good 
but there's no guarantee that Iron Thorns is making it into the deck, especially something like Maridon that naturally has a good Lugia matchup anyway. That's kind of one of the biggest targets this ability has, and I don't think Maridon necessarily needs that help. So, yeah, interesting card, scary card, certainly, with a lot of potential. It's just that, will it actually fit into 60 cards in a deck list, or will people come with the tech cards, like the bundles and the flutters, to help out against it? On to Greninja EX, another one we've talked about a little bit already. It's a 310 HP fighting type Terra EX, so no damage on the bench, worth keeping in mind. Has that Ninja Blade attack for one energy that deals 170 damage, and you may search your deck for any card and put it into your hand, and then shuffle your deck. So it's kind of like that quick search ability, and I think realistically you might end up seeing this with Pidgeot just to be able to tutor out very specific cards throughout the game and just keep on sort of recycling Greninjas and uh, obviously like leaning into the low energy attack cost and high HP that this Pokemon has. Also is a great typing as well. We've just mentioned how uh, some Lightning decks look to be very, very popular and things like Iron Hands and stuff aren't going anywhere. So a uh, really good typing to have as well. Also has that duplicate barrage attack for water and double colorless that you discard two energy from this pokemon and then you deal 120 damage to two of your opponent's pokemon so always a nice one to keep in mind i think a lot of the time you're going to be trying to cycle greninja and like take a hit and then pick it up and stuff like that but any turns you have extra energy attachments or you're able to accelerate some energy uh, all in one turn you're able to pull off a pretty powerful effect obviously this was um the attack that rapid strike uh, shifu vmax had which was hugely impactful in the meta game and whilst this is on a stage two um we're in a better place for being able to recycle these stage twos now so i don't think it's the build around part of the deck necessarily um it's just a nice option to have towards the late games try and take multiple prizes at once uh, obviously because the froki and frogadier are water types it means that we can run an irida engine as well which also kind of helps with the Pidgeot to an extent, being able to tutor out things like the Candy to get the Pidgeot in play and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like a different way of looking at like the Arvanzard package is like a Greninja Irida style package instead. And because you only need one energy attachment, I think it actually works just about. It's serviceable at least. Uh, we kind of mentioned Frostlass and TMD Vu earlier on as well. I think this is probably the best user of that kind of combination too. Uh, being able to put some more counters on your opponent's Pokemon, ready to set them up for Duplicate Barrage, or maybe just take a couple of Devo knockouts. Obviously, you've got the Irida combination in here as well. So, yeah, pretty cool one. At the, at the heart of it, it's still a Stage 2 EX, and I still don't think it has the sort of stopping power that things like Dragapult and Charizard have. And that's why we've settled on a 3-star. Uh, it is one of the more serviceable uh, Stage 2 EXs, like I say, but still has some limitations in its damage output. And obviously being able to cycle Greninjas over and over is uh, still a bit of a headache here and there. So I don't think it's as powerful as some of the ones we've had, but is at least playable to an extent and has seen some early Japanese results. On to the big one then, Dragapult EX. It's a dragon type with no weakness, no resistance, one retreat cost, and has that Terrastal text on there as well. 320 hit points with two solid attacks. Jet Headbutt for one colorless, deals 70 damage. That's enough to pressurize, poke some evolving Pokemon and get rid of Confei and stuff. So it is somewhat relevant. It can even help chip into V-Star Pokemon if you really have to. But it's all about that Phantom Dive attack for Fire and Psychic dealing 200 to the active and six counters on your opponent's bench Pokemon in any way that you like. Really, really flexible damage counter placement so you can set up certain Pokemon across the game. Obviously going to be pressurizing some evolving Pokemon as well. Over two turns, that can deal with engine Pokemon like the Barrel. You could be setting up V-Stars over a couple turns as well. And we can even see Radiant Alakazam coming into the deck list as well so that you can push that 60 into 70s and 80s and whatnot, which is just even more dangerous. So we really are going to be taking Taking like 1.5 prizes a turn with Dragapult most of the time. Really are getting onto the board quickly and pressurizing lots of engine Pokemon as well, which I think is really important. This can have synergy with TM Devo also, where you're going to pick up lots of evolving candied Pokemon as well, which we know there will be a few of them in the format. So that Dragapult is exceptional. Not only that, it has an amazing stage one in Dracloak, which we would also rate five star on its own, by the way, um, with that telling spirit ability, allowing you to look at the top two cards of your deck, put one of them into your hand and the other to the bottom of your deck. This is airmail from Pidgeotto that we saw in the past, and it's been reincarnated in to a really useful stage two line, which is excellent. It does lead this archetype towards looking at things like TM Evolution as well for our early game synergy with Arvan, so we can get multiple Dracloak on board and then begin to draw through our deck in that regard. Thanks to the fire and psychic cost, there are a few ways we can try and power this up. Zartu is one of the more common ones here where you can attach a basic psychic to one of your bench Pokemon, then draw two. It's another handy stage one Pokemon that provides the energy acceleration for us, which is handy. There's also the 
Mela support it if you want to. Neo Upper Energy is also a possibility. Certainly Pidgeot EX builds of Dragapult look to use this A spec option. So these are all things to bear in mind. Also, the fire element could be the means that you accelerate onto the field, and that means that Charizard EX could also be a partner for Dragapult. A pretty interesting one, actually, where Phantom Dive is a really good early game attack. And as we know, Burning Darkness gets better the longer you go into the game, and this becomes a late game threat. So Charizard becomes like an energy accelerator as well as like a checkmate late game card, especially because Phantom Dive can be placing enough counters onto other Pokemon around the board to then lead into Burning Darkness to close out the game. So sounds like it's got a lot of great partners. <laughs> There's a lot of reason to like the card. It's got inbuilt consistency, uh, acceleration, no weakness as well, and that high hit points is just so tempting. It's going to be a hard archetype to counter. Yeah, there's so much we like about Dragapult, and it is taking over the game in Japan right now. I think we have started to see there are going to be some awkward matchups in the format. The likes of Maridon, Blissey uh, have come to meet uh, this archetype quite early, but I do think Dragapult's power level will be warping the format. There's things like Chen Pao and Charizard that are currently doing really well in our format, probably the top two contenders right now, and they get taken down a peg massively because they have a bad time into Dragapult when it can choose its prize map so carefully, play around Iono quite efficiently, and basically just be in control of what your opponent has in play and what they're allowed to have in play thanks to the threat of this damage counter placement and so much control over the opponent's board yeah really impressive card could talk about this for way longer it's definitely a huge threat and the format will be warping around it also just another quick couple of things <laughs> the main ace spec choice is neo up is there a scoop up cyclone is there unfair stamp is also a decent option I've already mentioned Radiant Alakazam, but also because you play Fire Energy, Radiant Charizard could be reasonable. Even Maximum Belt is a reasonable choice in this archetype as well to push that Phantom Dive to KO some basic EXs. Things like Iron Hands are one of the bigger threats for this deck. So if you have a one-hit KO option, especially with Arvin in the list, that could also be okay. So I think Dragapult will adapt and survive, and it is crazy, crazy powerful. I've really enjoyed testing it so far. On to Bliss EX, another overstated EX Pokemon. Uh, it's a stage one with 300 HP, so you already know uh, that you're going to have to deal a lot of damage to deal with multiple Blissey EXs, and that's kind of always been Blissey's thing, uh, trying to get multiple Blisseys out and really make it difficult for your opponent to win the game. Uh, this time it has the Happy Switch ability. It says once during a turn you may move a basic energy card from one of your Pokemon to another of your Pokemon. Seems quite innocent, but actually turns out could be a really good energy acceleration. Uh, you can move maybe... You're playing it with Teal Mask, you're able to Teal Dance to draw some cards and then move the energy off to start going for Blissey's attack return earlier on. You can also move it on to other attackers. Uh, maybe you're playing Blissey with Water Energy and you can play Radiant Greninja and attach energy that way and be able to use Moonlight Shuriken multiple times. That's quite a cool effect. Or similarly, you can just use it to power up strong attacks like the Blood Moon Ursaluna's uh, Blood Moon attack that normally takes five energy. Obviously, its cost is reduced, um, as we'll see momentarily, but you're able to get some energy acceleration and get attacking with that quite early as well. So, uh, yeah, it seems like quite an innocent ability, but very, very strong for setting up attacks. Uh, turns out one of the best partners is actually the new Monkey Dory from this set, which is, has a brilliant ability, Adrenaline Power, uh, that lets you deal more damage if you have Dark Energy on Monkey Dory, so you can... Quite simply attach one dark energy to a monkey dory and then happy switch it onto multiple and deal three uh, move three damage counters from your board to your opponent's board for each monkey dory in play which is very very powerful really synergizes well with blissey uh, being able to tank a lot of damage move all the damage off and then try and clean up a knockout with return its attack which for three energy deals 180 damage and lets you draw until you have six cards in hand so uh, typically the this deck may sort of fall down because there's no real draw engine but you at least get some supplementary draw from return each turn it's not amazing it's not on uh, on turn on your turn draw it's sort of then lets your opponent interact with your hand with things like Iono and stuff but it's still better than nothing so yeah very very interesting card the fact that it's a colorless type means that it has all of these different synergies with the different types it can play you also have things like Sharon's Care which is really powerful um, and Hero's Cape being able to create 400 HP Blissies that you can then happy switch all of the energy onto your next Blissey pick up the one with damage and then attack with the the new fresh Blissey with a new Hero's Cape and stuff that's a very very powerful effect again it's quite hard to weave these combos together without an onboard draw engine and um, the Monkey Dory deck typically doesn't have that draw engine so that may not end up being the best way to play Blissey but it has really impressed us so far one final note is we do have the 151 Chansey with that lucky bonus uh, ability it does have 20 less hp than other chances in format and that is kind of relevant when 120 is potentially a break point for dragapult because you're able to deal six twice um so being under that 120 mark is a bit awkward but radiant alakazam would get around that anyway so and we think the benefit from lucky bonus is probably worth it regardless letting you 
potentially take an extra prize if your bench isn't full and you draw the chancy from prizes. It's, again, not an effect that's ever going to be reliable or one that you can lean on, but sometimes it will actually just end up stealing games and if nothing else will be a brilliant highlight reel moment for those PTCG Live game players. So that's at least something I think the deck has really impressed me so far and whilst it's not quite that five star, it does definitely still have some big issues. The damage output is a bit of a, a bit awkward and having no one board draw outside of return can really prove quite annoying. Uh, but there are definitely some matchups where you just will be way too big for your opponent to deal with and the monkey dory healing is actually quite powerful so yeah really fun archetype one to keep an eye on and definitely try out when uh, the cards are out onto that blood moon ursaluna it's a 260 hit point basic ex pokemon that is absolutely absurd its ability is elder's technique this Pokemon's attacks cost one colourless less for each prize card your opponent has taken. Very similar to the Excited Heart of Radiant Charizard, exactly the same actually. And the attack is Blood Moon. For five colourless energy, you deal 240 damage and this Pokemon can't attack during your next turn. Also, with that text, it's relevant to note that it does have a three retreat cost. So it is quite a chunky Pokemon in all senses of the word. But it gives us essentially a colourless version of Radiant Charizard. Now, Charizard is... Partly such a good Pokemon because it forces a late game single prizer, especially when you're using it alongside hand disruption. But Blood Moon has such high hit points that can also cause the same situation in a lot of matchups where if your opponent can't get over 260 or possibly even some health buffing tools on top of this card, think like Pidgeot Control could be using Ursaluna plus Hero's Cape as a combo. That sounds really terrifying as a way that they could like penny loop this card in a late game situation and start pressurizing those prize cards. 240 isn't a crazy threshold, but it is certainly enough to like finish off some Pokemon you've prepped or deal with basic EXs. So I do think this is going to be a great counter once again to the likes of Raging Bolt and Maridon, which come out the gate swinging, but kind of lack that damage output, certainly the Maridon at least, to hit that 260 unless they have a Raichu prepped. So the fact that this is colorless means it can go into all sorts of archetypes. The ones that stand out right now, and the reason why it's got that five-star standing, is that it turns the late game of Lost Box into having, essentially, Radzard, but in a two-prize Pokemon, whilst we still get the draw engine of Greninja and get to use Mirage Gate, which is so insane to effectively have both Radiants in one deck now, and the fact that Lugia can have this very cost-efficient low-energy attacker means you can really overcommit early on your Mincino, Chinchino, and whatnot to have the maximum tempo plays available and still have enough resources in the back with Blood Moon to sort of finish off the game and in a similar sense if your opponent has been able to take out multiple Archeops early you still have that Blood Moon fallback to be a decent late game option especially in a deck that already plays Jet Energy you can get in and out of the active quite easily for that secondary effect of the attack as well so super versatile certainly going in at least Lost Box and Lugia and is worth considering in the Blissey deck that we've already mentioned just some higher damage output controlling archetypes could certainly look towards this card because it can gain so much hit points and maybe even things like Ogre Pond that is lacking its own damage output having this universal beat stick is also looking very promising. Finally onto some one star bulk EX Pokemon What's well, Sinistry X with deal puts damage counters based on the number of grass energy in your discard pile and then you shuffle them in uh, again it's just way too weak it's like 240 HP very very fragile my cargo EX can ground burn for 240 similar to the half flame mask but again it's a stage one and you need to play cypher maniac to be able to do that not really strong enough and finally, Screamtail has the Sudden Shriek attack, which stops your opponent from playing any supporter cards on their second turn of the game. It's not strong enough. It's not going to be seeing any play in any decks realistically. So yeah, three bulky EXs, unfortunately. Only three this time, though, which is better than some sets recently. And that's our EX rating summary. Feel free to pause if you want to have a bit of an overview as to where we are at with all of our EXs. But other than that, we are straight onto the one prize Pokemon, of which we're starting with Thwacky. Now, we've already talked about Thwacky a little bit. It has the Bag Bang Drum ability. I'm not showing a turn. If your active Pokemon has the Festival Lead ability, you may search your deck for a card and put it into your hand. So it's Pidgeot's ability if you have a Festival Leader uh, in the active spot. Uh, that's not bad, considering you can put multiple Thwackies out at once. Now, obviously, that's going to take a lot of bench space, and you're going to have to search for multiple Stage 1s, but the benefit definitely outweighs the cost, and in the Festival Lead deck, it's basically what's going to weave all of these single prize attackers together. Uh, the deck's quite clunky, regardless, even with the Bang Bang Drum ability, but with the ability, you at least can weave multiple attacks in at once um, with the 
festival grounds and the stadium and all of these different stage ones that you need to be playing. So there's that aspect of it. There's also like the controlling aspect of it. And Joe and I have been talking quite a bit about the controlling side of Thwacky and whether you can build a control deck that has a one prize board state similar to the Pidgeot control decks that we've got at the moment with things like the Regieleki and using the Goldeen with the festival lead ability as your lead Pokemon as well. There's definitely some cool archetypes that you can try and build with Thwacky. It could potentially pave a way of having this one prize control option. I think Dragapult is potentially going to cause some issues for that. Obviously, your single prize Pokemon um, that have low HP, so they really are cleaned up by that Phantom Dive attack. But still, could be a new way of playing the controlling archetype and could be a nice way of trying to have a one prize board state, which is often a way that these uh, control decks like Leverager lead in some matchups. Um, I think, realistically, the Festival Lead deck isn't quite going to be good enough. It's going to also have some issues into Dragapult, but does at least boast some good typing. So uh, we'll talk about the Festival Leaders in a moment, but Thwacky is kind of the backbone of them all. And uh, it's quite a cool way of being able to search out for multiple Pokemon and weave this uh, like combination of cards into your hand every turn that you need to have to be able to like keep streaming Diplins turn after turn. Staying on that train of thought then, we have the Diplin. It's an 80 hit point stage one grass type. Has that ability that says it can attack twice with its own attacks only, of course. It can't use multiple Evos or Devos or anything else shenanigan-wise. It's only its own do the wave tack, but it can use it twice. It does 20 for each of your bench Pokemon, so that's 100 damage with the full bench or 200 if you're using that two times over, which means you can KO a Charizard EX cleanly, which is one of the biggest boasts of the uh, festival deck, I suppose. Also, because we have that thwacky engine that's going to help us maintain our board state quite nicely, we can try and push our damage output that little bit more with the likes of Kieran or some tool cards as well. So even when we're not hitting for weakness, we can be reaching up to like 260 or 70 or so uh, with this combination of supporters and tool cards. I think with such low hit points on Aplin, which is only 40, Diplin itself and even all these thwackies, it's quite likely that if you ever want to have a chance against Dragapult, you can play a Rabska line. The good news is, even if you play a low counter of Rabska, not only do we play the Buddy Buddy Poffins, but you also play the Bug Catching set, so you can have a decent chance of getting that stage one into play, especially if you've gone first into the Dragapult, and sort of cross your fingers that you can hold out for a little while to just sort of keep your board retained. I suppose you also could play something like Radiant Serena and Picnic Baskets in the deck as well, that's another thing that I considered, uh, but it does sound a little bit awkward to try and help out your matchup. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be a nice type coverage boast, and a solid attacking single prize deck with a great engine behind it. I think it just has to worry about a couple of high tier threats in the metagame. The likes of Iron Hands will be a problem if you can't respond on it immediately. And Dragapult could be an issue as well, no doubt, which is why we're going to give it that sort of mid to low tier status. Similarly, Goldeen for that controlling aspect and maybe even the festival aspect as well has that festival lead ability and also has an attack whirlpool for two colorless that deals 10 and you flip a coin if has discard an energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. I think rarely you're actually going to be using this, but it at least is some kind of uh, discard potentially uh, for that controlling archetype, which is quite funny. Uh, realistically, you're going to be sticking a rescue board on this, is this and this is just going to be what you promote when your opponent takes a knockout or at the start of your turn uh, to try and get into the active so that you can use Thwacky's ability multiple times to tutor out the pieces you need. Uh, obviously, you've got cards like the Yakimo and all of these other different controlling tools that you're going to try and pair with in this uh, deck to find at specific times and, you know, really try and control your opponent's board state. Uh, this sort of fits into both those archetypes, but obviously this is a little bit more focused, I guess, on the controlling archetype. So again, fits into that three-star category just for that potential there. Onto Iron Leaves, an interesting future Pokemon that could end up making it into Lost Zone Box archetypes. The Vengeful Edge is the attack that we're taking note of here, which for one grass, two colors deals 100, and if any of your Pokemon were knocked out by damage from an attack during your opponent's last turn, an additional 60 damage. 160 does fall short of KOing a Charizard, so you probably would have to be playing uh, a town store package in your lost zone variant and you have to be playing grass energy in your deck as well so it does it does take a lot to sort of warp around this but the selling point is still there that you could use a single prize pokemon to uptrade into charizard it's something that the lost zone deck really doesn't have right now oftentimes it has the frenzied gouge and that comes with its own handful of headache uh, so it could warp the archetype quite significantly but we have seen that town store plus defiance even just throwing in the future booster energy capsule could be useful here the booster could obviously also work on iron hand so it's not the worst card to include into a deck so if charizard is still going to be sort of around that a tier it could be a means of adapting your lost zone engine at the moment that we feel like charizard's not going to be public enemy number one anymore so it may just be too much warping of your deck list to consider the iron leaves right now 
onto the one prize finisher. So 70 HP for a stage one, which is already quite low. Again, we've already talked about uh, Dragapult, so it's already a bit awkward. Has the Cursed Droplets, which puts four damage counters on your opponent's Pokemon any way you like. Not really good enough, but could clean up some knockouts here and there. And then the Matcha All Out attack. That's the main attack that we're going to be looking at for one Grass Energy to 70 damage times the number of basic Grass Energy you discard from your Pokemon. Realistically, you're probably going to be pairing this as like an out-the-box attacker with Teal Mask Ogapon that's going to Teal Dance on some energy to draw some cards, and then you're going to match it all out it into the discard pile. You can even play the Sinister EX to then shuffle all the energy back in with that Infusion Retribution attack and clean up a knockout here and there that your opponent has maybe moved to the discard pile. Um, realistically, it's just, again, not quite going to be strong enough. You do at least have some inbuilt consistency with things like Bug Catching Set and having the same uh, attackers from the same line with the Sinister EX and the one price Sinister, but realistically the attacks just aren't powerful enough and there's not enough payoff uh, to trying to build this archetype. Even when you're uh, knocking out Charizards or you're dealing super effective damage to Charizard and stuff, there's now a new Pokemon that you have to deal with uh, in Dragapult that makes your life a massive headache anyway. So yeah, a really cool one, but just not going to be good enough to actually see play in this kind of like grass box deck. Onto Milotic, an interesting stage one that has that ability Tranquil, the main selling point of the card. Your opponent's Pokemon in play and the cards attached to those Pokemon can't be returned to their hand. So you actually block the use of Penny and Scoop Up Cyclone. And there are some archetypes that are entirely built around these sorts of picking up effects to undo damage throughout the entire game. There's actually another interesting Milotic currently in format as well that has the Lifeboat ability. Uh, when you evolve into that Milotic, you can look at... Uh, each player's discard pile and put a Pokemon from there into play. So there's possibly a world where we can consider a 1 Feebas and a 1-1 one -one split of these Milotic as a mini package, giving yourself an answer to some controlling archetypes by stopping their main means of healing and also having a means of putting Pokemon into play. Ideally, multi-prize Pokemon so that you can cash in with gusting effects to take easier prize cards. So I think at the moment, I don't see a world where this 1-1-1 one, one, one split happens, but the fact that it exists is really interesting, and that could be a creative space for possibly some like low damage output, fast aggressive deck, something like a Maridon that can get stuck by like a Hero's Cape Penny Loop, now could play this package, and then in other matchups, the Lifeboat Milotic could be the one taking the wheel, so that you can then just use that 1-1 one, one line still effectively in your list to pick off some certain Pokemon on your opponent's bench and make sure you're taking multi-prizes every single turn. Definitely an interesting thought experiment. I don't think we necessarily have the best stage one search to make this happen just yet, but I do think this combination is certainly interesting. On to Frostlass, a Pokemon we've talked about a couple of times today. It has the Freezing Curtain ability that says during Pokemon checkup, put one damage counter on each Pokemon we play with an ability except any Frostlass. So with a couple of these in play, you can be putting potentially four counters in between turns going from your opponent back into you uh, on your opponent's Pokemon with an ability, which is quite cool. The only real applications this has seen uh, any play in is in that Greninja that we talked about earlier on, but I think it works quite well because you're already playing like an Irida engine, so you're able to search out the Frost Lasses with like spare Iridas you have after you've searched out the Greninja pieces and got that sort of on the go. And again, obviously sort of leans into the duplicate barrage potentially, or just making Ninja Blade eventually take one hit KOs uh, in the late game after you've done some freezing curtain maths as well. Again, synergizes quite well with TM Devo, and I think that's probably the biggest reason to consider this card right now. It feels like we're in a format where there's a huge amount of uh, potential stage two Pokemon that um, are going to be in play that are rare candied up, and you're able to potentially TM Devo and take multiple prizes at once. I feel like we're slowly getting to this critical mass of actually being able to build a proper spread deck, but I still don't think we're quite there. So I think the best partner for now for Frostlass will just be the Greninjury X. I still don't think it's going to be uh, sort of breaking the bank, and uh, as we sort of, sort of talked about with Greninja, there's still some issues inherently with the archetype itself, but the best partner for Greninja seems to be Frostlass, and the best partner for Frostlass seems to be Greninja, so kind of like an, another out-the-box archetype coming from this set. On to more Peko, a pretty interesting basic that could have a couple niche applications. Its ability is Snack Search. Once you're in a turn, you can look at the top card of your deck, then you discard it if you want to. Uh, it's not that powerful, but it could be useful for adding to discard synergy style decks, like the Ancient Box, which wants to ramp up that Vengeance Fletching at every opportunity, and has some fairly weak supporters at the helm, with Sada only drawing three, sometimes even if you're not discarding an Ancient card, but you're getting rid of a 
card that's not all that helpful could help your Greninja draws or your Sada draws throughout the game as well. Or this could go alongside Maridon to help out with Electric Generator. You can take a peek at your top card. If it's a Lightning, lovely, let's fire that generator off. If it's not, we can throw one into the discard pile and effectively have a six card dig to improve our odds. The other cool thing about the Morpeko, specifically in a Maridon deck, is the pick and patch attack for one Lightning allows you to attach up to two basic energy from your discard pile to your Pokemon in any way that you like. Very similar to Squawk Ability EX, but the big upside is if you're not getting this huge attack off early with a Maridon dealing with a basic two prizer or Iron Hands, if you've had the absolute dream combination, you can simply retreat into this Morpeko and use that pick and patch attack to leave a one prize Pokemon in the active position whilst loading up energy for one of those follow-up attacks on another turn, or even just scattering energy around the board to help with a Raichu V as well. So there's actually enough synergy here, and obviously Maridon can search out the Morpeko early, that it might make it into the deck list. I think more often than not, it's not making the space, because your bench is still too valuable for other Pokemon to be scattered around the board, but it is at least an interesting consideration card in these archetypes. Onto Enamorous, a Psychic type 120 HP basic Pokemon with the Love Resonance attack for a Psychic and a Double Colorless. Deals 80 damage, but if you have a Pokemon in play with the same type as one of your opponent's Pokemon, you can deal 120 more. So 200 for 3 energy. Realistically, this is only ever going to be an option in like Mirage Gate decks where you can uh, get that energy cost activated in one turn. And those kinds of Confei Mirage Gate decks do typically have a lot of different types. They have the Greningers, the Iron Hands, uh, the Roaring Moons, even potentially Iron Leaves and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different types in that. Uh, those types of decks, which means that Love Res Resonance is likely to be hitting for 200, but a lot of the time you have so many types so that you can hit for weakness in on, in so many different uh, situations. So a lot of the time there's not going to be many situations where Enamorous is dealing more than one of these attackers you're playing anyway, and if you have to have things like Iron Hands and Roaring Moon on the board uh, just to get the additional damage, they, they'll either be dealing more damage or potentially be liabilities on the bench for your opponent to take two prizes on anyway. So whilst it's a quite a cool attack and seems to fit in really well with that Lost Zone style engine and the energy cost uh, works really well because you're typically already playing Psychic anyway for Sableye and it's two colorless energy so it works really well with Mirage Gate. It's just not quite going to, going to be good enough. There's too many board restrictions, even with, um, you know, having all of these different types in the deck for you to actually realistically want to be doing 200 with this quite weak attacker in the first place. Next up, we have Monkey Dory. This is me and Jack's favorite Pokemon from the set. It definitely passes the vibe check. We're giving it a four star. We wish we could give it five because he really is an awesome card. Such a nicely designed card. It's Adrenaline Power Ability. It says once during a turn, if this Pokemon has a Darkness Energy attached to it, you can move up to three damage counters from one of your Pokemon onto one of your opponent's Pokemon. This is a really Really interesting ability because you have to sacrifice turn attachments onto this Pokemon in order to trigger its ability, which limits the amount of archetypes it can go into. But in the archetypes that it does work in, this really is a powerful effect. It's actually a bit of a monster, to be honest with you. It's a 110 hit point psychic type with one retreat cost as well, but it's all about that ability, to be honest with you. Blissey, thanks to that happy switch that Jack mentioned earlier, means you could actually have multiple Blissey and multiple Monkey Dory procking in a turn. You could be spamming these adrenaline power abilities to possibly even knock out things like Dracloak on your opponent's bench mid-turn, if you're able to use a number of these, and then you get your attack in as well. So you can be really pushing into evolving Pokemon and pressurizing your opponent's bench really, really nicely if you can have something in the active taking hits for you, and Bliss is a perfect example of that. Uh, so they're, they're going to be a fantastic combination together. The other one is Gardevoir, which can naturally damage its own board every single turn of the game, simply via your Psychic Embrace. So again, having a Monkey Dorian Darkness Energy package in your list, alongside some Earthen Vessel, means that as soon as you activate this combination in the deck, have it as a bench sitter for Gardevoir, suddenly you're pushing Miracle Force to hit 220 into EXs. Screamtail can now be sniping Luminions and Rotoms quite early on. You're pushing that Drifloon into being able to KO uh, even Stage 2 EXs and whatnot with Bravery Charm without the need for Luxury Cape. So that is huge. This is an amazing math-fixing Pokemon. It's spammable in Blissey, where it just feels like a crazy card, to be honest with you. But even having that three damage counter swing 
it every single turn in Gardevoir is huge. And Gardevoir had a fantastic result in Japan. Blissey has only just started to uptick and had a fairly reasonable run in the Champions League, although didn't quite make it into the top 16. I think were it to have made it into one of those slots, it would have had a lot more headlines. I think people are jumping onto this archetype quite recently from what I've noticed uh, and from the ratings. Generally, people are also on board that Monkey Dory and Blissey are strong cards, uh, but they really are big selling points. And this card is actually one of my favorite designed cards and Pokemon that I've seen in a long time. So personally, he's a real treat. On to Fezzendipity and Ogie Dogie, which unfortunately are not quite as strong as Monkey Dory, which is a shame. Fezzendipity has the Adrenaline Pheromones ability, which once during a turn, if this Pokemon has any dark energy attached to it, and if any damage is done to this Pokemon, you're uh, you flip a coin, if heads, you prevent that damage. So this could potentially see play in a Gardevoir deck that's already playing Monkey Dory and therefore playing Dark Energy as a potential one prize attacker in like a one prize v one prize matchup. Uh, because Energy Feathers deals 30 damage times the number uh, of energy attached to this Pokemon. So you can like load a load of energy on with Psychic Embrace. And uh, at the end of the day, you're still going to be getting like you're potentially going to be getting knocked out regardless. But with the Adrenaline Pheromones, you're potentially not. So you could potentially go two for one and uh, take multiple prizes with just one one prize attacker. Realistically, you're not going to see too much play outside of that, but could potentially be a one of in the Gardevoir archetype that is already playing the Monkey Dory. Ogie Dogie, on the other hand, has the Adrenaline Power ability, which says once during a turn, if this Pokemon has any Dark Energy attached to it, it gets plus 100 HP and is attached to 100 more damage. Uh, very impressive, to be honest. Uh, awkwardly, it's Oki Punchy attack. Uh, actually costs two fighting energy so realistically you're going to have to either find a third energy a dark energy or play luminous energy to be able to uh, actually get the effect of adrenaline power it does turn okie dogie into quite a strong attacker to be honest 230 on a one prizer uh dealing 170 for best case scenario two is quite impressive but realistically it's just going to be too uh, too much of a cost to actually get going and I don't actually see where this fits in I don't know really what uh, ends up playing this maybe at best it's like a lost box attacker for dealing with things like iron hands but I don't think it's really going to be powerful enough um, even with the buff that uh, adrenaline power gives it so these two aren't quite as good as the, the monkey dory but still interesting nonetheless. Onto Tatsugiri, another great Pokemon we're getting from the set. It has 70 hit points, one retreat cost, it's a dragon type, and has that attract customers ability. Once during a turn, if this Pokemon is in the active spots, you may look at the top six cards of your deck, reveal a supporter you find there, and put it into your hand, then shuffle the other cards back into your deck. So it's one less card than a Poker Gear, but this is going to be an onboard presence Pokemon, which is a huge deal because it gives you a great way to protect yourself from hand disruption uh, throughout the game. Thanks to Rescue Board and Arvin being such a powerful card right now, there's a lot of ways that you can justify adding a Tatsugiri into your deck list. Also archetypes that think about having Town Store, then also immediately have the question mark of should I add a Tatsu plus Rescue Board combination in my deck, because suddenly I can have a great late game on board option. This could be amazing for Maridon, which loves to come out aggressively and swinging, and doesn't really have much of an engine to fall back on outside of Radiant Greninja and Mew EX, which only draw a couple cards. Having a Tatsugiri at your disposal means you could get straight back into a research or a game-winning boss's orders and have a deep dig into the deck which is absolutely massive so that's gonna be great for aggressive decks but also setup decks who love having four of counts of things like Arvin could be massive so you can hit your rare candy combos same thing for Irida you can see on the right hand side of your screen we know how important Colrus and Sada are to their respective archetypes so giving yourself just maximum odds of not whiffing is absolutely insane as a combination Tatsugiri and some of these archetypes may fall short of something like a Pokestop plus gear combination things like Ancient Box decks may still go down that direction but I think if you're already playing Arvin certainly or Town Store as an option Tatsu is just amazing. It's showing up in Dragapult, it's showing up in Charizard decks. Uh, it's fantastic for the aggressive archetypes as well. So there's so many versatile options for the Tatsu that you can construct your deck around it a little bit and justify its inclusion and get a lot of value throughout the game with this card. Really, really handy one of. And that's our non-rulebox summary. Feel free to pause here if you want to take a look at all of our ratings. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be Twilight Masquerade. A very, very interesting set. A lot of uh, really cool cards. I think it's going to be quite a, an interesting format for NAIC. It's going to be one of these 
one and done format. So we're people are really going to be investing all of their time into trying to work out how to break this meta game and work out what's best in this format just for the NAIC because we've already found out that Worlds is going to be a different format again. So yeah, going to be a really interesting one. As always, some brilliant arts as well. I think my favorite is probably the Greninjury X, but um, yeah, some really, really good arts in this set too. Yeah, can't wait for this one. We've already started testing and it's not long now till we get the set uh, for PTCG Live. This is going to be a really important tournament for people. Obviously, we're getting towards that last chance saloon now for many players. And of course, there's a huge chunk of cash on the line at the NAIC. And because the next set for Worlds is only going to be a holiday set, this is still going to be at the forefront of the format going into the World Championships. So this is a really important one. A lot of interesting cards, some new archetypes coming out of nowhere. And finally, we're sort of seeing the dethroning of some archetypes that have been around the top tables for a long time in our format. So going to be a big shakeup. Thanks so much for watching. If you've made it to the end, leave us a like. Let us know your comments down below. What's going to be your favorite new archetype from the set and your favorite artwork of the set as well? Why not? That's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed and we'll see you tomorrow for another one. Cheers.